I'm Ilana Varro. I'm with PJ Dixon, and we are here at the Sacred Self Worth interview series. And we've been talking about how loving ourselves and accepting ourselves really improves all areas of our life health, wealth, relationships. And PJ is my man, my main expert on love and relationships. And I'm so excited to have you. I love your perspective. I love everything about you. you. And I'm excited to have you share your wisdom with our audience. So PJ, why don't you give us a little intro of who you are and what you do? All right, all right. So um, a lot of people want to know, like, where did you get started with this? And the truth is that I've always been a pretty spiritual guy all the way back to being a little kid. And um, that spirituality carried into my ways that I related with people and connected with people. And I found myself in high school really being the one that everybody came to to ask about relationship uh, issues and problems. And in fact, um, my mom would also even talk to me when I was a kid about what was going on in her relationships. And with my mom being a uh, psychologist and um, an art therapist and you know, me being spiritually inclined and wanting to just love everybody up. Uh, it was just a natural glove and hand, hand and glove um, kind of match for me to move into this, uh, this area. And yeah. so it further, like just further, just a little bit more is that without getting into a whole big long diatribe about my history and my background, um, when I was uh, 28, I moved to Arizona, 28, 27, 28. Yeah, when I, in 1997, October of 97, I moved to Arizona. And when I moved to Arizona, um, my spiritual teacher at the time said, go home and pray and ask God what, you know, God wants you to, to do with your life. And so I sat quietly and I did my prayers. And then I, after I said, well, what, I believe I'm in Arizona for a reason. What is it that you want me to do? I'll do anything that you, that you direct. And I closed my eye. My eyes were already closed. And... I just got still, I just get quiet, got quiet. And all of a sudden this pillar of golden light came through the ceiling, hit me in the top of the head and filled me up. And all I heard was one word, love. And I knew in that moment, it didn't matter what I did. What mattered is whether or not I did it with love. And I thought, well, heck, I've been a speaker since I was seven years old. I know how to love people up. That's what I do, right? Yeah. So that's easy. What would happen, that was October of 97 and April of 98. I got hit by an SUV, tossed out into three lanes of traffic, and had time enough to pray to say, God, please, whatever you do, don't let him roll over my pelvis. He came to rest leaning against my pelvis with his front driver's side wheel. Two more inches, he would have crushed my pelvis. There happened to be an EMT team in the restaurant he was pulling out of. They ran out, picked me up, and took me across the street to the hospital. I wasn't intended to die that day, but I spent four months in excruciating pain, and not one physical therapist could figure out what was wrong with me um, until the very, very last day, and my physical therapist was like, PJ, we've done uh, uh, electric stimulation on you. We've done massage. We've done range of motion. We've done aqua therapy. We've done all these different things, and I don't know what's wrong. I've talked to my uh, mentors, my professors, I've consulted all of my books, my medical journals, and I don't know what's going on. I did talk to one mentor recently who said, you might have popped your pubic bone out of place when you hit the ground. So he palpated my um, pelvis bone. Sure enough, that was what was wrong. And this is what's important. This is the most important piece of the whole story. He said, this is going to hurt. Do you want me to do it? And I said, yeah. You know, so what he did is he grabbed a hold of my pelvis bone, he popped that thing back into place. Ah, right, so much pain. But the moment he popped it back into place, all of a sudden, all the pain was gone. Hmm. This is the important part of our lives, right? So many people are like, oh, I don't want to do that because that hurts. Oh, I don't want to do that because that scares me. Oh, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid. Oh, what if somebody like um, doesn't accept me or I'm not good enough or, you know, so we experience these, these feeling of pain or suffering or fear within us that stops us from actually getting what we want. So I voluntarily said, yes, pop that sucker back into place. If that's the problem, let's do it. Pop, ah! And as soon as he did it, all the pain, in the past four months, and I thought that I was going to lose everything because I already was having troubles lifting my arms. I couldn't push my wheelchair anymore. I couldn't sit up. I couldn't lay down. I couldn't roll over. I couldn't feed myself. I couldn't work. I couldn't do any speaking. I was stuck like Chuck, mm -hmm. and my life was spiraling downward. So as soon as he popped that back into place and all the pain was gone, immediately there was this overwhelming sense of appreciation within me. And that appreciation, when you fill up appreciation, if you look at the word appreciate, it comes from 
um, a word that means to appraise. And it, appraising means to set a value for something. And so mm -hmm. I immediately valued that I was pain free. And that when I filled up with so much val that so much of that appreciation, appreciation that spills outwards becomes gratitude. And gratitude is the expression outwards of appreciation and thankfulness. And that gra gratefulness, when gratefulness becomes so large, that's when it becomes love. And that's when I realized seven, eight, 10 months earlier, um, when I got hit by that SUV or when I, that pillar of golden light came through the ceiling and, um, and filled me up and said love, that wasn't telling me to go out and love other people. That was reminding me and teaching me to learn to love myself mm. so that I could learn to teach other people how to love themselves. So from that moment forward, many of my presentations changed and started revolving around talking more about love. And that's, you know, that eventually led me into coaching people around love and relationships and mm -hmm. self love. And, yeah. you know, now I'm, I'm back to, this idea of becoming the best version of yourself because the best version of yourself includes loving yourself and loving others. Yeah. Do you think it's possible to have healthy relationships if you don't love and appreciate yourself first and foremost? Great question because of the words healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because most people say that you can't love um, somebody else if you don't love yourself. And I disagree. You can look at a mother, a single mother who really doesn't like herself very much, but loves her children with everything that she is. Yeah. Right. So there is love still there. But can you have a healthy relationship if you don't actually have a healthy, loving relationship and respectful relationship with yourself? It becomes really, really difficult because a healthy rela relationship requires you to be able to pour into them mm -hmm. and be open to receive. Yeah. And if you don't have enough to pour into them, then you're not really giving. And if you're in a state where you need so much, eventually they may get to the point where they feel like all you're doing is taking and not giving. Yeah. And so there's a profound difference in relationships um, that are give and take versus give and receive. Mm -hmm. I believe that healthy relationships aren't give and take. They're give and receive. There's a profound that. difference between taking and receiving. I love that. Yeah, I love that so much. Me what too. You, what? Me too. <laughs> That's why we get along so well. We're on the same I know. <laughs> I know. I get it. I'm going to have to move around. Everybody, I'm, in a, I'm a little dude in a wheelchair, and just so you don't know. Because you know what? It's so funny. You asked me to tell my story, and I didn't tell my story about being in a wheelchair. Right. Or, yeah. uh, so I never Isn't mentioned that, funny that that didn't even come to your mind. It doesn't. I was just interviewed for a book that uh, John Asraf is also being featured in. Mm, yeah. And um, my uh, the person that was interviewing me said, yeah. hey, can you tell me your story? I went like 45 minutes telling my story. And then he's like, um, that's great. But you didn't mention the disability at all. And I was like, <laughs> oh, I didn't. He's like, no. And I was like, oh, okay. So I had to go back for another 30 minutes or whatever. So like, I just have a, just so everybody has an idea, I have a very rare form of muscular dystrophy that was expected to take my life by seven. I turned 49 this year. So I've lived 42 years longer than I was supposed to. So if you see me moving kind of funny and you know, it's because, yeah. Mm, 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 mm. <laughs> Got some badass dance moves, yo. You what? Sure do. You sure do. <laughs> I've, I've had the pleasure of rocking out on the dance floor with you, so I can I know, I know. That's the way we roll. <laughs> so it's such a beautiful, like, visual story of the golden light and really coming to realization that I need to accept myself and appreciate myself. What, what was your definition of self-worth before, and what is it now? How did you relate to that concept of self-worth? Because it's such a cliche term, or it can be, that's really thrown around, but it is a powerful foundation of, of something that we have to have in my eyes. So can you say a little bit about that? Sure. You know, I've always realized and recognized my disability was a gift to other people. Um, but uh, I walked with leg braces until third grade, um, third, fourth, and fifth grade. I threw them away. Uh, literally, I remember mm. seeing them stick out of the trash. Nice. Sixth grade and seventh grade, I was too weak to walk with leg braces. In eighth grade, I couldn't walk very very far, like 20 feet without falling. So that's when they put me into an electric wheelchair. In seventh and eighth grade, when the hormone dump comes and you're in that adolescent stage were the roughest years of my life because um, I had, you know, I had connections with everybody prior to that. No problems uh, kindergarten through sixth grade. Seventh and eighth grade was just rough for me because I just couldn't figure out who I was, whether I was coming or going or what was going on. But then I started to get my legs underneath me again, so to speak, in high school and then up through college and all the way up till now. 
but I used to struggle in high school with, I, I knew that my disability was a gift to other people because, you know, so many people would come to me after being on stage or they would see me out in public because they would see me on TV or they listened to me on a radio show or whatever. And they, so I couldn't go anywhere, anywhere in the United States really at that time without somebody know, knowing me. And yeah. so that was a great way to be. I loved that. Um, and, and so I recognized that it was a value to other people but I still didn't love myself. And people would say, well, you need to learn to love yourself. I was like, oh, like love yourself? Like, I don't yeah. know what that means. Yeah. What does that even mean? Like, love yourself? How do you love yourself? Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I liked myself. And sometimes I really didn't like myself at all. Because I would look at myself in comparison to others. But when I looked at myself for the value that I brought others, that's when I really liked myself. And that's when I started to realize that I didn't just like myself, that I really liked who I was as a person. Um, And that's a little bit different because you can like yourself, your being, and you can like how you show up for other people, Mm -hmm. right? And so you may not, you, that single mother that I mentioned that loves her children, she may love the way she shows up for her children, but she doesn't like who she is, Yeah. right? And so my self-worth really started when I was a boy, just because I have an amazing mom, but it was also really nurtured externally for me by being on stage and getting off of stage and being, you know, having the opportunity to talk with so many people afterwards that said that, you know, my story changed their life. Um, and so thank you very much, you know, all that. But ultimately, that's coming from outside of me. Yeah. And so I had this ability to like who I was and show up for other people, but I didn't like myself when I compared myself with other able-bodied guys, when I compared myself with not having the connections romantically that I might've wanted in my life at those times. And so when that um, physical therapist popped my hip back into place and I had this overwhelming sense of appreciation for the life that I thought I had lost. Mm. See, this is what's important, right? This is why I said I had to go through the pain voluntarily because I was taking my life up to the accident for granted. Mm, like wow. it just was the way it was, right? And it was really easy and people would like call me to do presentations and you know, um, it was just easy. And yet I didn't appreciate what I had. And so when it was taken from me and I was in excruciating pain, I started to spiral downwards and started to only see what I couldn't do. And I didn't identify with what was left and what I could do. And so I was only holding on, I was basically holding on to a big rock and I was sinking to the bottom of the ocean quickly um, because I wouldn't let go of the rock. Yeah. The rock being the weight of the suffering. What did you think that was doing for you? What did I think holding that on to that suffering? was doing. When you're in that state, you don't think about what it's doing for you. Yeah. You're in reaction mode. And there's and I say that reaction is, is a slave action, right? Because reaction, you don't think about it. If you're walking along, you trip, whap, right? And you go yeah. down, you throw your hands out to catch you, right? Yeah. You slip getting out of the shower and you grab for anything you can. A ball flies, um, you know, you're playing kickball or whatever. And I don't know why I chose kickball, but probably because it's a softer ball, right? You do that with your hands, right? Or you catch it, right? So. Yeah. I, I didn't go to catch. I went immediately to block. <laughs> right. That's what I do. Boom. I get buddy. Um, Cause you know, catching is not a thing for me. Um, so, um, so when I went to this, uh, to the doctor and he popped my hip back into place, all of a sudden that feeling of appreciation for the life that I thought that I had lost. Yeah. All of a sudden there was that level of appreciation for something that I'd taken for granted four months earlier. You know, yeah. those four months of excruciating suffering and being allowed to see what I lost or what I, what I, yeah, truthfully being allowed to see what I lost and then all of a sudden being given it back. Like it was as if I let go of the rock and I had um, like a life preserver on that immediately popped me back, popped my head back above water, just literally yeah. snap your fingers and I was boom, I was above water and I could breathe again. And in that place of appreciation, the, I'm actually feeling it right now. Um, in that place of appreciation, there's a profound depth of gratitude for, to God and for the life that I was being given back. And when you're in that state of profound appreciation and gratitude, 
that excessive amount of gratitude, as I mentioned earlier, turns into love. And I realized that it was about learning to love myself. And so it was this transition that allowed me to look at what I have and look at the abilities that I, that I had and my ability to push my own wheelchair, transfer myself, feed myself, shower myself. Like I had all of this amazing independence and I was able to motivate and inspire people that didn't have disabilities like me, yeah. for example. And because of that, I realized in those, literally I was still in the doctor's office when I was just overwhelmed with this level of appreciation and gratitude and love. And in that moment is when I started to realize how amazing life was. I transferred myself from the, the, the hospital bed or whatever it's called. I don't know that, you know, that examining table dropped down about two feet to my wheelchair um, by myself. I pushed myself out of the um, out of the hospital, out to the car, something I hadn't done in four months. I didn't mm. have that level of freedom. Yeah. And all of a sudden I had this freedom back. And when you realize what you actually have and you combine that with what you actually, the value you actually bring to other people, what's there not to love? Yeah. All of a sudden there's this realization that, wow, I matter. Yeah. And here's one, let me say this too. So many people and probably people that are listening to this, they have this amazing feeling, right? Oh my God, I love everybody. And I just want everybody to be healthy and happy. And I want everybody to feel loved, but they forget to include themselves in the everybody. Yeah. Remember, we are not everybody without you. Yeah. We are not everybody without me. Yeah. Everybody means includes you. Yeah. So when you love everybody else, but you don't love yourself, you really are doing everybody else a disservice because you are not filled and full to be able to pour into them as much as you could and should. Mm -hmm. You know, an empty refrigerator um, feeds no one. Yeah. An empty heart doesn't nurture anyone. Yeah. So what would you tell someone that, you know, they haven't gotten to a place of having this awakening and yeah. they know things aren't working exactly well in their lives, but you know, not everyone has such a profound experience of, of waking up to the fact that, oh, I need to really love and appreciate myself. What would you say to someone that kind of has a hint of, you know, I should, I get a feeling that I should probably like myself more, appreciate myself more, connect with myself more. Mm -hmm. What are some tips that you would have, you know, give those people? Okay. First of all, change your energy level right? Like raise your energy level, come alive again. Like you because, just did. Yes. Like I just did. Right. Because what I realized is I was talking to you at a, an energy level that I don't typically like to be at. And it was because I was like introspective and you know, how you sometimes like you go inside yourself and yeah. you just get kind of quiet and all that. Right. And so this like energy level is the guy that you know more. Yeah. And this is the guy that I like to be, right? So this is super important. So when you change your energy level, immediately I feel better. And anybody who's watching this and listening to it, I'll bet you're feeling tingly inside of you because of that mirror neuron is turning on based yeah. on what I'm doing, you're getting enthusiastic and inspired. Yeah. Right. right. And so this is important, right? So you can turn it on for yourself. So immediately pour more energy into your life. This is number one thing. And so once you raise your energy level and you get more enthusiastic, enthusiastic comes from enthusiasm. Enthusiasm comes from entheos. And entheos means in or full of God. Ooh, right? I, love that. I know I love it too. Right. It. Inspiration, inspire yourself, inspiration in spirit. Love right. It. And so um, somebody asked me yesterday, they said I was doing another, uh, another interview yesterday um, for a Facebook live that I do. And um, this guy said, PJ, what's the difference between power and empowerment? And I said, let me think about that for a minute because I haven't thought about that before. And I said, mm, okay, I get it. Empowerment should actually be in power, meaning the power inside of me. Yeah. And then when I express it outwards, that's the expression of power. That's love what power is. Love it. Right? Yeah, I love it too. So this is, this is the same thing, right? So be within your power. So yeah. find a way to be empowered. That could be like, and power is going to be different for you during different situations, right? Mm -hmm. if, you, um, if you have a child and they fall down or a little brother or sister or you're babysitting or whatever, you have a nephew or a cousin and they trip and they fall and they skin their little knee on the concrete, right? All of a sudden, the power that you want to be in is that power of loving and nurturing mm -hmm. and patience and calm, right? And compassion for them. That's the power you want to be in. Yeah. Right? But if somebody- Yes, inside of yourself so that you can pour that into them, yeah. right? So that you, can, that you can use that power to influence them. Look, your question really was about power, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so when you become empowered, and empowered doesn't mean you have to be like, you know, it can be that. You know, empowered can be running and feel like, wow, I feel like a million bucks. I'm so glad I yeah. went out and ran. Yeah. Empowered can be like, 
wow, it's been two years since I pulled out my paints and now I'm painting for the first time. Oh, this feels amazing. Yeah. Because it's about the connection. It's about that spiritual alignment and that spiritual connection that you get. This is when your authentic self starts to come out, right? When you're actually in your power. Yeah. Because when you're in your power, this is when you can make actually good decisions because when you're disempowered, you won't make decisions or you won't make good decisions and then you'll second guess them and you won't take action because you won't feel that level of confidence. And so um, one of the things that you can do is find a way to raise your energy level. Mm -hmm. Okay. What Another thing, that, yeah, say again. What are some examples other than like, you just came alive, you smiled, your posture shifted, you know, the tone of voice shifted, the smile, smiling with the eyes, any other things that really help shift energy? Yeah. So just physically moving your body will change that, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care if you shadow box, if you jump up and down, do jumping jacks, run in place, <laughs> right? Just smile. Um, it doesn't matter to me, but get yourself in motion. Meditation works for some people. Mm -hmm. Okay. So sitting down, because this was going to be my second point is sometimes people are like, yeah, like I want to be like energized and happy, but I've got so much on my mind. I can't get my mind to shut down. That's one of the problems, right? With people's levels of energy being low and not really building themselves into this authentic person that they, that they really can know and trust and love. Right. One of the reasons that we're unhappy is because we're not being authentic. We're not being our true self. Yeah. We're not being our true self often because we're li living our life through a filter of obligation. Ugh please that's the worst and i am so good at that i'm not really so good at it anymore but i used to be really really good at living from guilt and obligation and oh, i'm yeah. getting much much better much better about living for myself so that i can show up more fully and completely for other people yeah much healthier much Love happier it. much Love better it. right yeah yeah yes no, oh, no, go I ahead. Say, I wanted to hear yeah. you talk about masculine feminine energy yeah. and power too as we were talking about the power within you um you know, you have a very specific perspective on male energy, female energy, and how, how people portray that and tap into that. That might be helpful for people to hear too. Great. Okay. So I speculate that the vast majority of your listeners are going to be ladies. So I'll start mm -hmm. with the feminine. Yep. Right. Women get their power from giving and men get their power from taking. Okay. So actually, I guess I'm going to start with men. All of the universe is built on contrast. So you can't have up without down, in without out, light without dark, masculine without feminine, okay? And so when I say men get their power from taking, if you look at how men tease each other, like even if men are friends, right? They tease each other, they joke with each other, they like put each other down a little bit, and yet they build each other up too. It's because we're looking for that pecking order to so that we know who is the alpha and who follows that alpha. And we know like if that alpha leaves, who then becomes the alpha. And that's really important for men because in that process, um, it allows us to function together as a unit, like in terms of protecting the tribe or you know, hunting or whatever. Um, it also allows us to realize that since we're always looking to be the alpha, um, or looking for the opportunities to be the alpha, that gives us the chance when we come back to our wife and our children to be the leader of that family. And that doesn't mean that we don't take into consideration um, our wife or our, um, our partner's perspectives and opinions and that we don't listen to our children. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is that when a decision needs to be made, we make it and we follow through and we protect and we provide. So, but now let's shift to women, right? And so I could talk more about that if you want me to delve into that more, but um, more specifically about women, mm -hmm. women get their power by giving. Women inherently, now look, I'm stereotyping and I know that, right? I'm very much connected to my feminine, but I'm also much more connected to my masculine over the past couple of years than I ever have been before in my entire life. Um, but I like this softer side of me, the, the more feminine side. So women have, and so why the reason I'm saying that is because I'm going to be stereotypical when I speak right now. And so women may understand this and some other women might be like, that's not really me. I feel more inclined towards that masculine energy. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Mm -hmm. So um, if we're just looking, we're looking at the energy, not really this, the gender of the person. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. So this is an important distinction. Um, and so if we're looking at that feminine energy, right? Feminine energy is, is embracing and nurturing and enveloping and it pours this softness into other people and feminine energy is this beautiful energy where you reach out with one of your hands let's say you're right-handed or left-handed doesn't matter if you're left-handed you think about it in your left hand and you reach out and you touch the face of a little child you know or your lover 
or a little old lady or a little old man, right? Like grandma or grandpa or whatever, right? And you reach out and you touch their face and with your thumb, you stroke their cheek and you look in their eyes and your heart just opens. And there's a softness that pours through you and out of you and into them. And you realize and witness love quicker often than men do. And I argue that, I don't argue this, but my definition of love is the willing exchange of oneself for oneness the willing exchange of oneself for oneness. And so when you reach out and you touch the face of that little old lady or little old man in the grocery store, you know, that stopped to talk to you or the little, you know, the little boy that um, is shopping with his mom, you kneel down and you touch their face or you touch the face of your partner, your lover, right? And you look them in the eyes and you stroke their cheek with your thumb. All of a sudden there's a softness that happens in your body. And when the softness happens in your body, what happens is, tension is removed from your body and when the tension is removed from your body it's as if the cells create more space between them and it's not even the cells it's the space between the atoms and the space between the electrons and neutrons and protons that makes them up and the space between the quarks that makes them up and the space so it just creates more space in your being and when it creates more space in your being Women feel the presence in them more. They feel like this tingling sensation through their body. They feel this um, sensuality. They smell um, smells uh, more intimately. They taste more uh, fully. They see the beauty in things. They move softer and slower and, and more gracefully. And this is when I'm talking about this, I'm talking about this at the extreme of feminism versus, you know, somebody that's, you know, hanging out with their girlfriend and talking and, and bouncing around and all of that and being more, a little more lively and energetic. That's not, not feminine, but I'm talking about it in the extreme. And so um, give me a second. I'm going to be quiet for one second. Sure. Because I want to feel this. I want this to come through me, not from me. Um, so give me one second. There's also this flow that comes in through a woman's head and enters her heart and fills up her whole being. And when she's being authentic and, and open and receptive to her sensuality also, not just her five senses of sensuality, but also her sensuality sexually, um, there can be this feeling or this flow, this openness that comes out of her also from her, um, uh, from her lady parts, right? That then exudes out and when she moves by a man, um, a man feels that sensuality. He feels that femininity. He feels that softness, even from a distance, and it draws his attention. And when a woman is soft like that, a good man will, and, and let me say this, when a woman is soft like that and keeps her standards very high, the man that is interested and attracted to her, yes, she's likely to have some men that uh, don't really appreciate who she is and the value she brings to the world. But more often than not, she will also have men that will be like, wow, you're amazing. I feel you like I don't feel anybody else. And the man will raise his standards to meet you because he will be interested in being enveloped and being connected with that feminine. He'll want to protect that feminine. And so just like I talked about the feminine energy um, embracing and enveloping someone that they love. The masculine will then embrace her um, around that, so around her feminine nature. So he creates the space of almost solidity to protect her from the outside world so that she can be authentic in who she is. Have you ever had um, and this is, this is asking you, Ilana, but also any of the audience, have you ever had a man, it could be a partner, it could even be your dad or your favorite uncle, I mean, not from a weird state, a weird state, but have you ever had a man who cares about you walk up from behind you and hug you from behind? Mm -hmm. And women, when that happens, women typically go, <sighs> they just melt into their feminine, because all of a sudden that man's actions say, I've got you. I've got your back. Yeah. Yeah. I've got your back. I'll, yeah. I'll protect you and I'll nurture you and, and keep you in a safe space. Yeah. And everything that you were saying is so like 
what I kept hearing is own your power, own your power. Like fe females own their female power, men own their male power. And it's just like really connecting into who you are. And then that will shift yeah. what other people see as well. So it really comes back to you owning all that you are being clear and being connected of how you're showing up in the world, what you're projecting, mm -hmm. what you're feeling on the inside, yeah. Yeah. a lot of, a lot of awareness and connection. So, so let me add to that. Let me modify it slightly. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of owning your power, but I like the idea even more of allowing your power. Mm, yeah. Right. And here's the reason why owning my power means that I have a grasp on something and I'm in control of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Whereas allowing my power means that there's no filter, mm -hmm. there's no resistance, and there is only the purity of openness and receptivity and allowing it to naturally flow out of me, into me, through me, and out of me, and the way that it needs and wants to move. And yeah. so when we do this, we're in this state of impeccability, right? The word sin means to miss the mark. The word impeccable means to not sin. So if we are really truly in that divine state of feminine, or that divine state of the masculine, when we are, op are open and we allow that power to flow through us, we may not know what we're saying or doing until we're actually saying and doing it. Because we're in that state of alignment with the divine, uh, alignment yeah. with, the, with the universe, and we find ourselves moving in a way that we don't necessarily know what we're doing or why we're doing it, but all of a sudden, the reason that we decided to go into this store when we've never even thought about that store before, we'd passed it a hundred times and we're like, oh, I want to go in here right now, right? And we meet somebody and it changes our life or changes their life. You know, that's allowing spirit to guide us. That's allowing yeah. that flow to guide us. And so I like this idea of owning it. When I need my power, I'll own it. Yeah. Right. I'll yeah. take it and I'll own it when I need it. Right. Because yeah. then it becomes a tool for me. But the rest of the time when I'm not in need of it, but I just want to allow it and I just want to be it. That's when I'm authentic. I like that's, that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I like that clarification a lot. Thanks. And it just, the word flow align, yeah. you know, openness yeah. when you're allowing it, there's just more ease. Also. I feel like a lot of times people think like this needs to be work and it's difficult and it's challenging and I have to, you know, change who I am and it's going to be hard. Uh, so I really like this perspective of you're just, you're actually shedding and releasing and doing less. Yeah. So can I talk about that changing? Oh, yeah. I've got to change and it's going to be hard. Right. And the shedding and releasing is exactly what I wanted to say this idea. Right. So Michelangelo, you probably had somebody already say this or your audience has already heard this. Right. But I'm going to say it again because I freaking love it. Michelangelo is asked, you know, Hey Mike, what, how do you know what to carve out of the stone? My man Mike said, shoot, dog, I don't. I just chip away what don't belong, right? That's exactly that's what, what he said. Because right? that's what my boy talked back in the day, right? What he said was, I, I don't. I chip away what doesn't belong, yep. right? I chip away what isn't art. And yep. he also said, David was already in the, the marble. I just removed the pieces yep. that, don't, yep. that don't matter. Yep. And so this is a great opportunity. If you want to really be authentic, and this is a big like catchphrase or catchword right now globally, but it's really important because when a concept takes on globally, it means that there's an evolution in the way the human beings are thinking. And so since authenticity is a big word right now that we are we are very much in an evolution globally. We are making an effort to get our femininity back. We're making an effort to get our masculinity back. Um, and yet there is still some degradation. And that's okay as long as you are the one who's getting better. And you are, when you get better, you are inspiring others. So here's the thing. If you're like, oh, it's hard and I don't want to change. That means I have to change. I have to let go of this. I've got all this stuff going on. All we have to do is simply just release the things that are no longer working for us. Right. So when we look and we go, you know what, that story isn't helping me anymore. And if I let it go, who would I be? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know who I would be. So since I don't know who I'd be, I'm going to hold on to it and I'm going to hold fast to it. And then I'm just, I'm going to create all this resistance. Then you're not going to be authentic because that story that's coming up, the old traumas from your past and the old ways of thinking, those aren't authentically you those are programs inside of your brain that yeah. then create a belief structure that create the way you think that create the way you you act and talk associated with all of that and mm -hmm. so if you realize you know what i'm uncomfortable or unhappy this is great because um 
cosmos. Another thing that I've been saying lately, like since the universe is in contrast, right? If I find that I am uncomfortable, all I have to do is shift. And so if over here I'm uncomfortable and I'm like, oh, I don't like it. And that person is mean to me. And I hate it when that person says that. And I don't like my job and I don't want to go here. And I'm really lonely. And, and this, you know, I need to lose weight, whatever it is. If I'm over here, and I'm uncomfortable. No problem. That is just information to let you shift to over here and go, you know what? This is what I really want. Yeah. So what happens is the uncomfortableness is, a, is giving you the power of the springboard over to here where you get to be comfortable and happy. So all you have to do is identify, wow, I don't like this. Okay, yeah. so then what's the opposite? Not even the opposite, what's an alternative? And as you find alternatives, you'll slowly move yourself from the state of discomfort and unease and disease, disease to this space of, oh, this is better, this is better, this is better. Wow, this is really what I want. Wow, I'm super happy yeah. where I really want to be. So don't think about going boom to boom so quick, right? Because like so many times people say, turn that frown upside down, yeah. right? And people are like, I can't, like I'm not negative, I'm struggling, I'm pessimistic. I'm not a pessimist, I'm a realist, uh, right? And they struggle with all this crazy stuff. In their brain and they're like, I can't, like just let it go, right? And so I say, well, then don't let it go. But let's instead consciously go from negative to neutral. Yeah. And then from neutral to positive. Yeah. And negative to neutral happens consciously where you go, you know what? I just want to consciously think about something else. I want to study something else. For example, this one of the, the examples that I give more often than not is I was riding the short bus home one night and something had happened um, earlier with somebody that I was doing some work with. And I kept running it over and over and over and over in my head. Now, I wasn't consciously thinking, Right. I was letting my thoughts think me. So I always say this, think your thoughts. Don't let your thoughts think you. Love that. Think your thoughts. Don't let your thoughts think you. Okay. But I was letting my thoughts think me. I'd gotten trapped in my own craziness. And so that was no good. I wasn't happy. And so all of a sudden when I was like, oh, crap, Marcus, I got caught by my own thinking. Okay, fix it. And I, I couldn't shift from the negative to the positive. I just couldn't get that right in my head. It couldn't shift negative to positive. And I know and I understand that when I say I can't, I'm not able to. So whatever it was that I was saying in my head at that time, I was not able to make that shift. So, but I'm smart enough to realize negative to neutral to positive. I'm smart enough to realize through the, all the years of meditation that I've been doing that the human mind really can only focus on one thing at once. And you might say, no, 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 no. My mind thinks about a thousand things at one time. Yeah, and that's not time. true. Right. In one millisecond, it's thinking one thought. And then the next millisecond, it's interrupting itself. And then the millisecond after that, it's interrupting it again. The millisecond after that, it's interrupting again. The reason this creates stress is because you're not experiencing any, experiencing any fluidity. There's no flow. There's no finishing. There's no completion. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so the subconscious mind is trying to throw up all of this information to try and get it resolved by the conscious mind, but the conscious yeah. mind is just like overwhelmed. So think your thoughts, conscious mind. Don't let your subconscious mind think your thoughts for you or think you. So anyway, I'm riding home on the bus and I say, Oh, you know what? I don't want to feel like this. And I'm not able right now to shift into the positive. So I'm going to look at the mountains and it happened to be the winter. And during the winter in Arizona and Tucson, the mountains turn these beautiful reds and pinks and blues and purples. It's so pretty, so pretty. So I started studying them because I'm also a watercolor painter and I'd like to paint them. And so I'm looking at the colors and the shapes of the shadows and how one color fades into another. And I'm looking at the shadows and I'm thinking, okay, like how do I paint that shadow? And what color is it really? Is it really gray or is it more purplish gray? Is it, is it more bluish gray? Like what would, how would I mix the paints? How much of the blue, how much of the purple, how much of the gray, right? So I'm really studying it. I'm like, okay, and if I made that mark on there, why does that look like a shadow to me? How would I transfer that with the shadows and the light to my painting to make sure that I'm creating this depth? So I'm really studying it. And the more I studied it, as you listen to me talk, I'll bet your mind was wrapped up in what I was doing. I if your mind was wrapped up in what I was doing, what I did is I, I stole your mind away and I trapped it in what I was doing. And so you do the same with your own mind. Mm -hmm. I trapped my mind in the curiosity of something else. Yep. And I became intentionally, intentional is the important word. I became intentionally curious and intentionally filled with wonder and intentionally filled with um, inquis inquisitiveness, mm -hmm. asking myself lots of questions in the study of that. And all the negativity just washed away. Yeah, I love it. it. washed away, I got out of the short bus and I was like, oh, wait. 
I'm not negative anymore. I'm not in pain or suffering anymore. Love oh, it. Okay. Then I could shift very easily into the positive. Negative to neutral to positive. Love it. Love yeah. it. I love that. Thanks. It's it's so funny because that's a therapy technique in itself. Oh, really? You know? it's, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, when you're really upset, it's to focus on something in incredible detail yeah. that is either pleasant or neutral. So that's really, really funny that you kind of intuitively knew how to take care of yourself. Yeah. And like you said, it's not always, you know, I want to go from sad to happy or from mad to peaceful. It's, it's just shifting away from the intensity of the mad, you know? So you can go from rageful to pissed off to... Eh, doesn't really bother me. But I think a lot of times people are put so much pressure on themselves to completely, you know, shift. When people hear shift, it's like, okay, so I have to totally abandon my experience and just fake something that I'm not feeling. So I love this perspective of just, you know, get super intentional and detailed about something other than that disturbing feeling. Sure. Absolutely. I love that too. And um, we can shift that quickly, but it takes some practice. Oh yeah, uh, and <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And yeah. it's all—it's always intentional. Yeah, that's always the most important piece. Love and it. letting go of things um, can happen in little little doses. Let me add one more little piece to this. Um, if you struggle with getting your mind to shut down, let me give you a couple of two three different um, opportunities for you to to shift that because this the more still the more quiet you get your mind to be the more healthy you're going to be the more authentic you're going to be the happier you're going to be the more likely you're going to bring that uh sacred love into you whether it's spiritual or romantic um so the first thing is meditation right everybody's heard about meditation not everybody does it not everybody feels like they can but they come to meditation often with this um this belief ahead of time that oh i can't get my mind to shut down well first of all you probably haven't tried very much second of all most people can't get their mind to shut down very much and uh, meditation gets it to to start to slow and quiet yeah right and so meditation doesn't have to be about sitting there and getting your mind to go still and quiet it can literally be about just sitting there comfortably and watching the thoughts rise and then watching the thoughts wash away and then watching the thought rise and another thought wash away and watch the thought rise and then another one interrupt it and another one interrupt and another one rise and so just yeah. watch and just get curious about your mind like i was curious about the mountain mm-hmm. yep. oh, wow, i wonder what my mind does when i'm not paying attention so let me sit and just pay attention to it and what will happen is you'll find you'll relax Mm-hmm. So pay attention to your breathing as you're doing that and just allow yourself to physically relax. When you physically relax, the mind will also release tension and you'll find that the mind will start to soften and become a little quieter because all of a sudden the conscious mind, this is important. I want people to really hear this. The conscious mind is giving the subconscious mind attention and the subconscious mind, whether you know it or not, or believe it or not, is actually one of your best friends. Mm-hmm. And the subconscious and the conscious mind should be best friends. The problem is that the, sub, the conscious mind feels like the subconscious mind never shuts up. The subconscious mind never shuts up because the conscious mind doesn't give it attention. If you instead, if, and then this is me transitioning out of meditation, okay, into my second opportunity for you is to sit down and actually have a dialogue with yourself in front of the mirror or in a journal or while you're driving down the road. And yeah. don't, just, don't just think it. It's, a, it's fine to think it, but actually talk about it, okay? Like I will literally get three inches away from the mirror because I want to see my face. I want to watch my facial uh, movements. I want to watch my eyes. I want to watch my pupils. I don't want to be distracted by anything behind me. I want to make sure that I'm seeing myself clearly and I'll decide which eye I want to talk to do I want to talk to both? I'll watch the whole being inside the mirror. And I'll have these conversations between my conscious and my subconscious. My conscious mind will say something like, why are we struggling today? What's really wrong? Why are we upset? Notice I'm saying we, because when I do that, I'm including the subconscious mind as my partner. The subconscious mind will say, well, we're really upset because this person said that and, and then they said this and, and you know that's not really what we meant. And so it'll throw up. And then when the conscious mind starts this dialogue, that means it's actually going to ask questions. It's going to resolve problems. The subconscious mind is going to ask questions. It's going to answer. There's going to be rebuttals. You're literally playing both parts, playing both roles. You're literally having a conversation with yourself. And so many people are like, oh, I'm not going to talk to myself. 
but you're actually talking between your conscious and your subconscious mind. And when the subconscious mind reveals, I say that the subconscious mind is responsible for three R's and the conscious mind is responsible for, for uh, the fourth. The subconscious mind is responsible to remember. And so the subconscious mind never forgets anything. The problem is the second R, which is recall. It doesn't always recall what you want it yeah. to recall. And sometimes it recalls only the crap that you don't want it to recall, right? And sometimes it recalls the stuff in the most inopportune times. <laughs> um, and so when it recalls it, all it's doing is it's just trying to get it out because it wants its, um, its third R to be taken care of, which is to resolve the problem or the conflict inside of it. Now that resolve, um, uh, sorry, it wants to reveal what's inside of it, sorry. I skipped ahead. Um, it wants to reveal what, what's going on inside of it so that the conscious mind can use its R, which is to resolve the problem. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when the conscious mind actually has a conversation and gives a voice to the subconscious mind, when the subconscious mind is actually able to talk, um, then the conscious mind and the conscious mind takes sincere interest in it, then the conscious mind will resolve the conflict. And then the subconscious mind will, in essence, say, wow, that feels better. You don't need me to remember this anymore or, or bring it up anymore. And the conscious mind's like, no, I mean, you're going to still remember it, but you don't have to bring it up anymore. You don't yeah. have to continue to you ruminate. Have to ruminate. Right. We don't have to ruminate on it. You don't have to reveal it anymore because it's already yeah. out and I've already resolved it. This is what I think or believe or how I'm going to handle it. So then the subconscious mind relaxes and starts to still and open up and it creates empty space. It creates space for something new, some more information to come into it, which is amazing. And then the third, so that's, that's actually like, sort of like you can journal that or you can talk. I always suggest that people talk to themselves in a mirror. Yeah. And there's then, also power in the vocal cords, you know, it's connected to the vagus nerve, to the stomach, to the brain, and just the vibration of, right. of you using your voice really has a profound effect on just your entire nervous system, so. And then to add to that, yeah, you're 100% right. And I love that you brought that up because I love the science of it, right? Not only that, but look at like how I'm getting excited. Then also the emotions come into it. So yeah. look, the human being is a human be full being. It's a system. We don't isolate out the psychology and the biology and the neurology and the emotions. Yeah. Right? They're all one functioning unit. So when you're talking about the the vocal cords and the vibration, we're talking about the physiology yeah. and the energy that the vibration, uh, the vocal cords create with the vibration. And then when you're actually playing the role of the, uh, of the conscious mind and the role on uh, verbally, the role of the conscious mind and verbally the role of the subconscious mind, you're also infusing it with emotion. Yeah. You infuse it with emotion. Now you're linking all of these things together. Now we have something to work with. Yeah. The nervous system is working. The emotions are working. The mind is working. The body is working. So all of this starts to come together as one unit. And this is one of the reasons that it works so well is because everything is coming together. Look, this happens anyway. Your subconscious mind is going to find somebody to talk to. If, it, if your conscious mind refuses to listen to it and just lets it just yammer on, the problem is that the subconscious mind is going to take control and it's going to direct you to a friend or a coach or um, a psychologist because event, or a counselor of some sort because yeah. eventually it needs to get it out. Yeah. Right? So and it's going to find somebody out, to talk to. It gets yeah. out a lot of times in kind of negative or self-sabotaging or even self-harming kind of ways. So... I love that. You know, it's always wanting to be expressed. It is always going to be expressed and you want it to be expressed in a healthy manner. That's also effective and, you know, helpful for you. Otherwise you can't, you can't ignore the subconscious mind as much as you, you think you can, or you feel like you're shut down, you're not in tune. It's still, it runs the show. So paying attention to it is awesome. Key. Give it its voice, right? Give it its voice. And yeah. you know what you're saying is um, what I call my the secret um, invisible R, which is revolt, revolution, rebel, right? Yeah. And so the subconscious mind will revolt. It will create a revolution or it re will rebel against um, everything and outside of its world. It will act out yeah. in order to get um, its voice heard. Acting out, yeah. Always. And so then the third option is meditation to talking to yourself in the mirror or talking while you're driving to journaling and yep. when you journal do the same thing like once what you'll find what i find is in the mirror you'll probably get about 80 or 90 percent out 
and you'll feel 80 or 90% better, which is great. But if you just still feel like you've swallowed the hook, like there's still something in there, when you go to your journal and you start to type or write, what happens is, and, and do it, like you can either do stream of consciousness where it just falls out of you, yeah. Or you can start the same process where you ask yourself questions and answer questions, ask questions, answer questions, respond, retort, whatever, back and forth, back and forth, back yeah. and forth. Eventually what happens is you'll throw up on the page. Sorry for being so graphic and gross, but literally um, it's as if you've thrown up on the page and as soon as it comes out, your mind will go, boom, there it is. That's mm -hmm. the culprit right there. Mm -hmm. That's the hook that I swallowed. That's mm -hmm. the pain point. That's the problem. Ah, uh, yeah. now I can do something with it. Now I can heal. Now I can feel like a whole human being. Yeah. Because I take care of this issue and this problem. The subconscious mind wants to get it out. It yeah. is literally your best friend. It wants to be still. I, I because, hear in my mind the audience's kind of voice, which I hear a lot, you know, with yes. the clients is like, well, I want to do it right. You know, that perfectionist, like, I want to make sure I'm doing it right. I don't know how to do it. And that stops people from expressing themselves is like, they worry that they're not doing it right. So like you just said, you know, it can be stream of consciousness. It could be like mumbo jumbo. It could be words. It could be colors. It could be like whatever comes to mind, just write it out because there's meaning in it. It's, it's happening on, on your body's level. So just remove it through words, through whatever. I have, I literally have a journal on my computer, which I use more often um, because it's easier for me to type than write. I've got three journals on the floor right here under my desk, right beside me because I write better on the floor than I do at, at a desk. And right next to the journals, I've got a, a, um, a mug full of colored markers and colored pens. Love so it. if I need to draw or color or paint, um, you know, I've got... I've got that access. If something yeah. needs to be um, drawn or colored, then it gets to be. If I need to write in a particular color, I get to, Love right? It. So I have that level of freedom. So there's that expression of the subconscious. And listen, I love that you brought this up because if we're talking about like, oh God, I'm afraid I'm not going to do it right. You're not a perfectionist. Listen to me. You are not a perfectionist. You think that you're a perfectionist. You're a procrastinator. And you're not even a procrastinator, yep. right? What you are is you're actually afraid to make decisions. You're not a good decision maker. And the reason you're not a good decision maker is because you're afraid. What are you afraid of? Well, I'm not confident. And why are you not confident? Because I'm not competent. It all comes back to competence. Yeah. And you know where confidence comes from? Just trying. Just practice. It doesn't have to be right. Don't worry about getting it right. No, you can go to the mirror and be like, am I doing this right? I don't know if I'm doing this right. Are you talking to yourself? Like literally, are you asking yourself questions? Are you yeah. saying, hey, why, why did that person really bother me when they looked at me that way? Yeah. Right? And then you're like, well, I don't know. I, mean, I just don't like to be looked at like that. Well, why don't we like to be looked at like that? Well, because I want to be you know, looked at as being a kind, loving human being. And, and this just bothers me when other people feel like this about me. Why are we positive this how we feel? So I'm just having a conversation. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'm literally just having a conversation. It could yeah. literally start with you looking at yourself in the mirror and being like, I feel silly doing this. Yes. I, like I don't know what I'm doing. And then, you know, it can be so simple and basic. Don't just do it. Don't, like you said, don't procrastinate. Just do it. <laughs> I, I'll <laughs> even get it doing right. When I was a kid, my mom said that I didn't need any toys. I just needed a mirror. I because I would get in the mirror and I would play with my face. I'd make funny faces. I'd look inside my mouth. I'd look inside my nose. I'd do different things with my eyes. I'd work the muscles on my face, right? And I could spend hours in the mirror. I still can, yeah. right? And um, it's not about arrogance for me. It's not about like, oh, look how pretty I am. I remember looking in the mirror for a period of several years and asking myself, who are you? Like, what are you? Like, what's... The, what makes you PJ? Like, um, why, I mean, why are you, you, who are you? What's in there deeper than that? Like, is this physical body like who I am? Like, I just needed to know more. Love it. Right. And so, yeah, exactly. So if you get in that mirror, like Ilana is saying, and you're like, well, this is silly. This is ridiculous. What you're doing is you're also stopping yourself from taking action. Yeah. You can say, Hey, look, I, I'm looking in the mirror and say, I feel silly doing this. Do you? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Right. And you're talking to yourself and you're like, then answer yourself. Yeah, I feel silly too. Well, why do we feel silly? Uh, I don't know because I've never done this before. Okay, well, just ask me a question. Um, what's your favorite color? You know what my favorite color is? It's blue, or it's yellow, or it's orange, or it's hot pink. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. Well, ask me a real question. Um, why are we so sad? We're so sad because, you know, Dad never really cared about us and. 
you know, even when we go over and see him, he still doesn't seem to take care of us. Wow. Now we're having a conversation. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Love it. Yeah. You can't do this wrong. You can't do this wrong. The only way yeah. that this won't benefit you is if you don't literally ask yourself questions and allow whatever comes up, yeah. don't filter it. Just say whatever comes out because it's just you in the mirror. Yeah. Don't do this with other people in the room or the house. Yeah. It's, it won't be authentic. Yeah. Okay. And oftentimes a lot of emotion will come up because this is very new of a practice. You know, most people don't, they look in the mirror, but usually to judge or critique or fix things on themselves, but never really to like see what's in there, who's in there, what's happening with that soul that's in that body. So I love that. That's awesome. I want to be aware of the time because oh, I- Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm a talker. I, I mean- I love you guys. I knew this. I knew this. And I could listen for days. I'm a professional listener. It's what I do. <laughs> um, but I just want to, you know, kind of wrap it up and just, you know, let's go over the, the three tips that you said. So the top three things to really connect to yourself and they were a meditation. So I would say- for me, the top three things for you to connect with yourself and become more authentic is I'm going to be, I'm going to close my eyes because I just want them to come out naturally. Um, the first process is letting go. Okay. And if letting go is through meditation or journaling or talking to yourself, do that. Let go of the things that are no longer serving or working for you. You don't have to let go of everything. Let go of something simple, something easy right? Just forgive. So go from letting go to forgiving. Uh -huh. And once you let go and you start, in, you can forgive yourself. You can forgive your children. You can forgive an ex-boyfriend, right? Um, so it doesn't mean you forget. It just means that you say, you know what, that doesn't serve me. And I understand that maybe I was coming from, or you were coming from, or they were coming from a place that they, they, were experiencing their own trauma or they weren't thinking about me. They were just wrapped up in what was going on with themselves. So I forgive that and start small. Okay. So begin to let go and forgive. The next thing is as you start along this cycle, then I would say begin to move into some meditation. That meditation can be run running. That med meditation can be painting or singing or playing an instrument. That meditation can be journaling. It can be, um, literally having these conversations with yourself in the mirror, okay? It's some way of getting your mind to focus on one thing, all right? You can go outside and become curious about the tree bark, right? Um, or go for a walk or a hike. Find some way to begin to still the mental chatter, all right? So once you begin to let go and you start to forgive, then find some meditative practice for you that works for you. If you like to be outdoors, think hiking or biking or going for long walks or running or mountain climbing, whatever works or swimming, maybe you're a swimmer, find something where you're present. Okay. A lot of joggers will work out a lot of what's going on in their mind. And when they come back and they're done jogging, they feel like, wow, whew, I got a lot of it out. Mm -hmm. Letting go. Meditation helps you to also let go. Meditation also helps you to forgive. And then let's move into the third, which is, Let's be authentic and real with ourselves. When you really look at yourself and you say, what do I really want? Where do I really want to be? Do I really want to be with somebody? Um, what kind of work do I really want to do? Where do I really want to live? If I could do anything with my free time right now, what would it be? And start to orchestrate and create these little <clears throat> growth spurts, these little, um, little tiny mountains that you climb up and succeed. Like if you want to learn a language, for example, um, commit to 10 minutes a day. Say, so, mm -hmm. you know what? I'm going to do 10 minutes a day. I'm going to learn three words today. That's all. Just three. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going to use them as much as I can throughout the day with myself or with somebody else just until it becomes um, a habit, okay? Um, or not a habit, but something that your brain goes, oh, I know that as, you know, you know, sayonara as a form of goodbye in Japanese, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so these are the three things, the way that I would start is learn to let go of the things that are small and forgive people for the small things so that you can begin to open up to the next level. Find a meditation for yourself, something that allows you just to wash away the mental chatter and be present in something that's valuable and important. And then 
following that, identify what's really valuable and important for you. And what you'll find is that that meditation, just like the meditation is a way of letting go and forgiving, that um, meditation also, whatever the meditation is that, you're, that you find to do, also opens you up for what it is that you want more of in your life. And so these are all linked together, intimately linked together. So when you decide, you know what, this third level, these are what I want to do. These are, this is the way I want to be and the way I want to live. I'll bet there's some form of that that could be done for your meditation. Mm -hmm. so yeah. You just get focused on something because if you're not actually living from this space of power, if you're not living from this space of authenticity, you're cheating yourself. Yeah. And the, more, the more that you live from this place of this is really who I am. This is really what I want to be doing. And this is really what I love to do. And when you do that, you're going to be healthier and happier. And when you're healthier and happier, you have health and happiness and love that you can share with others, including yourself. Remember, everyone is not everyone without you. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Thank you. How can people find you if they're wanting to come work with you, hear you speak? Yeah. So, you know what? Um, there's a couple of different things. I would say go to engagedinoneyear.com, engagedinoneyear.com. There are four videos on there. Um, about an hour's worth of entertainment. Um, I don't know if it's entertainment or not, but it's like how to find um, a man in your life, okay? Awesome. Gentlemen, it's actually relatively decent for you to watch too. Forgive the quality of the videos. I did them about three years ago and the content is so good and rich that I don't want to like recommit to all of that. So I'm just like, ah, it's bad, con it's bad quality, but it's great content. Love okay? it, love it, love Bad it. quality, great content. Love um, it. However, um, the other option is they can certainly um, go to uh, pjswisdom.com which awesome. I am changing and shifting over to be my primary um, speaking site. And I do coaching from there also. So you can reach out to me either way. And, um, awesome. you know, we can schedule a time to chat if you'd like. Rudy? Awesome. I highly recommend PJ to everyone, you know, men, women wanting to improve on their selves, their relationships. I mean, as you just saw, got lots of wisdom and insight and intuitive genius to share so thank you so so much for being so generous and being so loving and and giving all that you are and sharing it with us thank you so much i am super duper honored to be on here with you you're yeah. one of my favorite people i love you i respect you you are brilliant and anyone who is smart enough to get on this um this summit with you is already in a state of um uh what's the word growth evolution um expansion because you give so much so purely and so sincerely i love you i respect you and it's my honor to be with you and be here with all of your audience thank i you. love you thank you so so much i love, you. I love right. you guys too bye right we love everyone <laughs> bye guys bye